So today we're going to talk about software. Hardware and software are logically equivalent. We've said that before. If you can build a piece of hardware, given the right actuators, you can write software to do the same thing. And I think I gave you the example of the microwave oven with the springs and switches and dials, or the microwave oven with the microprocessor control. Um, however, general purpose hardware and the von Neumann architecture computer is a general purpose computer. That general purpose hardware needs software to define its purpose. Most computers that you are likely to encounter have at least two layers of software. That is operating system and application software. Your phone has an operating system. Remember the Android operating system was a big deal when it was first announced by Google. And if you happen to be able to afford an iPhone, you have the iOS operating system. You might not realize it, but your digital camera, if you have a digital camera, has an operating system. Okay. Before we get further into software, let me tell you that there's a class of problems that look computable, but that are not computable. These are called undecidable problems. The halting problem is the famous one. Alan Turing proved that the halting problem was undecidable. And when I say proved, I'm talking about mathematical proof now, something that you can absolutely hang your hat on. The halting problem is this. Write a program that reads in some other program, some arbitrary program, and its input, and determines whether that program that was input to this one will loop forever or eventually halt. That is undecidable. You cannot do it. If you would like a proof that is a little bit easier than Alan Turing's proof, you might look at the Dr. Zeus-like poem, Scooping the Loop Snooper. And that's a link, and it'll be on the slides when they are on D2L, which might happen earlier than happened Tuesday. I had a school appointment after class Tuesday. In addition to the undecidable problems, there are intractable problems. These are problems that are computable, but they would take so long that they, they might effectively not be computable. Uh, take an impractically long time, the slide says. Public key encryption, which we will talk about in the last class before the final review, works because finding the prime factors of large numbers is intractable. It would take decades. I can, not right now, but with a teensy bit of study, I could tell you exactly how you would write a program that would find the prime factors of large numbers. And you could write this program, say, in Python and start it running and come back in about 30 years. Um, and let me say, I'll mention this when we get to get to the study of encryption. Shor's algorithm, which works only on quantum computers, can find the prime factors of large numbers quickly. So in some years, the current brand of public key encryption, things like the RSA algorithm, are going to disappear in a puff of quantum computing. Right now, there are no real quantum computers big enough, well, that is, with enough qubits to run Shor's algorithm. Does that mean that encryption ends and the NSA knows everything? No. There is this thing called elliptic curve encryption, which is quantum computing resistant. So we'll still have public key crypto. Okay, the traveling salesman problem is another example of an intractable problem. This is one we have a salesman who is in his home city. He's got a list of cities to visit. We want to find the optimum route that takes him to each city one time only, and then returns him home. What is the shortest, shortest path to do that? And you'd look at that and you'd say, yeah, I can figure that out, but you'd be wrong. That one, that one really does look computable, but it is intractable. 
Now, the good news is that there are algorithms called heuristics that find near optimal solutions to some intractable problems, not all of them, but that take much less time than an optimal solution. A heuristic is an algorithm that is a practical approach to a problem, but it's not guaranteed to produce an optimal solution. It'll produce a pretty good solution, but it's not guaranteed to produce the best one. There are effective heuristics for things like route planning. So there are ways to, to do the traveling salesman problem. And if you think about it for a minute, Amazon has that problem. The Postal Service has that problem. We're not talking about cities now. We're talking about homes to deliver stuff to. But you want to take the minimum, minimum distance, never pass the same home twice, and end up back at the home base to get another truckload of stuff. That's exactly the traveling salesman problem. We would like to not waste time on problems that are intractable. Get something that's going to take 30 years. Sure, you can program it in Python and, and come back when it's time to retire. There is a whole study of algorithm analysis that happens in the computer science curriculum and maybe in software engineering. It doesn't happen in information technology, but it behooves you to know something about it. So when the boss says, um, go over in the, in the corner there and do me a routing algorithm for my trucks, you can say, gee, boss, I don't think we want to do that. Um, and then you can explain why. The big O notation considers the part of an algorithm that grows most rapidly. So we're going to eliminate all the time spent starting up a program and initializing things. We're going to eliminate the time spent at the end of the program. And we're going to look only at that part that grows most rapidly. If I'm searching an unordered list, the only real way to do that is to start at the beginning and trudge through it until I either hit the thing I'm looking for or, or I run off the end of the list. That is, has a time complexity big O of n for n items. If I double the number of items, the runtime of the search is going to double. There are algorithms that run in constant time, order one. The number of items is irrelevant. Uh, th that fact got me a doctor's degree. Now, I'm afraid I had a somewhat trivial example. I had to say two is greater than one, but I was able to prove it. An algorithm that's order of log two of n, or actually log anything of n, is a divide and conquer type algorithm. Binary search, where I, I know that my items are ordered, they're in order, they're sorted, so I'm going to look at the middle one first. And then I know that it's either in the front half or the back half. And then I look at the middle of that half and the middle of that half until I find the item I'm looking for. Or I've checked and I can say that it's not in the list. So that's a, a log 2 of n algorithm. I double the number of items, I only add one more step to the search. Order n, that's the, the linear search. If the number of items doubles, the time doubles. And all of these are reasonable things. Order n log n, log linear time, some sort algorithms are like that. We'll do a binary search and then do some sorting and then some merging. Let's look at the ones we want to avoid. If the n, the number of items, has a superscript, that's called polynomial time, so n squared, n cubed, n any of those. If n is the superscript, it's even worse, right? 2 to the nth power is much more than n squared for some number of n that is any, ki any kind of reasonable. That's exponential time. The traveling salesman problem is factorial time. Remember from high school, that exclamation point is factorial. So 
7 factorial would be 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. <laughs> and I've forgotten what 7 factorial is, but it's a pretty big number when you start with 7. I want to avoid those. I have a picture of all of that. Things that are order of 1, um, constant time, that straight line across the bottom. Order log n doesn't get big very fast. Order of n starts getting big. It doubles every time the number of items doubles. n log n gets big faster. Polynomial time n squared gets big even faster. Exponential time, now the n is in the exponent, faster than that. And as an old friend of mine might have said, factorial time takes off like a rocket ship. You, you just cannot do reasonable numbers of cases with an algorithm that takes factorial time. So the two things you take away from this is that there are undecidable and intractable problems, and there's a way of measuring them. Now, we, we were talking about time complexity, but there's also space complexity. How much memory does an algorithm need to run? And there are, there are algorithms that run much better if they have a lot of memory. There are some that won't run at all without a lot of memory. And we can use big O notation for that as well. Now, software is hard, and that surprises people. Y'all had to take a programming sequence before you could get into this class. And if you had not done programming before, you might have found that programming sequence to be difficult. Or you might have found it to be the greatest thing since chocolate bars. I don't know. But Fred Brooks, and he's the guy whose name I couldn't remember when we were talking about software being hard um, a couple of weeks ago. Brooks said, software entities are more complex for their size. So we're talking about complexity versus size than any other human construct because no two parts are alike. And I think I gave you the example that there are three or four standard sizes of bricks. And if we're building a building, we're going to pick one of those standard sizes. And all the bricks are alike. That is not true when we're doing software. Brooks also said, believed, the hard part of building software is the specification, design, and testing of the conceptual construct, the data, the algorithms, and the functions and how they are invoked. This is the planning part. He said that is the hard part of building software. And for non-trivial software systems, he is absolutely right. You might be given a trivial program to write. Maybe you started off with Hello World, and none of this really matters. But when you get to non-trivial programming, this is the hard part. Sadly, because it's hard, we have developed a culture of design as we build. So we'll start coding and hope that we come out with something. <laughs> One of you is giving me the grin because you've done this, I guess. We start coding and hope that we come out with something usable in the end. Often, we toss it over our shoulder and start over. If you read the foreword to the book written by Dr. Rutherford, as I asked you to do way back in January, uh, Rutherford gave the example of you would not start building a house without at least a sketch of the plans. Yeah, but we start building complex software without even a sketch of where we're trying to go. And part of it is that software was not always hard. It was a surprise to the first people who programmed computers. And the reason that it was a surprise is those first generation programs were translating to computer language mathematical formulas that were already well known. So we remember ENIAC was built to compute firing tables. Well, the firing tables were being computed by rooms full of women with calculators. The reason they were women is that the men were in France carrying rifles, right? So, but 
a room full of women with calculators, and there were formulas for what they were supposed to do. It was a matter of translating that into computer instructions, and that was easy because the requirements were already specified. Software turned out to be hard when programmers tackled things that had not been already specified. This is the design as we build thing happens, and the result, Mariner spacecraft off course because of a missing comma, $18 million blown up, um, between 1985 and 1987, the Therac-25 radiation therapy machine was, because of a programming error, able to deliver radiation doses hundreds of times more than the physician had prescribed. When you get a radiation dose that's 100 times more than you're supposed to, it kills you, including killing some patients right up the road at Kennestone Hospital programming error. USS Yorktown, divide by zero error, caused the computer that was running the navigation for the ship to crash, leaving the USS Yorktown dead in the water. As we saw yesterday morning, navigation is a big deal when it comes to ships. We don't, we don't want errors there. So, a whole bunch of what we have, where we've gotten in computing was developed by the military, including ENIAC, a military project at, at the, the first programmable electronic computer. NATO is a military alliance, and the NATO leaders got, the slide says alarmed, they got scared witless that they were sinking zillions of dollars into software that they could not prove was going to work. And so NATO sponsored a couple of software engineering conferences in 1968 and 1969, which seems like a, you know, dinosaurs roamed the earth. It didn't work. We continued to have both spectacular and dangerous software. Um, errors. The Ariane 5 rocket, not very many years ago, had to be destroyed after launch because of a, a navigation software error. And instead of $18 million, it was over $300 million of rocket and payload. Okay, so IEEE defines software engineering, and I want you to notice that there are three different definitions in here. They, they have, have put 10 pounds in a 5-pound sack. The application of systematic, disciplined, quantifiable approach to the development, operation, and maintenance of software. That's one of them. The application of engineering to software. That's the second definition. And the study of the approaches to the application of engineering to, to software. The third definition. We're not there yet. And here's part of the reason. Classical engineering, the, the folks over across the way in the engineering building, have their disciplines founded in physical and chemical laws. You can go take a strength of materials course and know exactly how much load a particular beam will carry. You can compute it. And ultimately, the foundations of classical engineering are in mathematics. So if you go over there and, and start taking engineering courses, better be ready to learn differential equations. I used to be able to do ordinary differential equations 50 years ago, but I couldn't solve one now, uh, at least not without struggle. Okay, software engineering does not have that foundation in physical laws. There are no physical laws about software, unlike steel beams. And that means that software engineering is necessarily a set of best practices. We figure out the best way of doing something, and we call that engineering. It isn't. And the real engineers over there will tell you it isn't. They'll tell you it's a best practice. The good news for us is that best practices can and do evolve. Um, my experience with Windows 11 
is that it is much less stable than Windows 10. Uh, if you got something that works, you think you could make it better. This is not on any slide anywhere, and it won't be on the exam. But Brown's rule of software engineering is that it is foolhardy to assume that changing X will not mess up Y. That's what happened to Microsoft. They changed things and messed up other things. Okay, so programming, we have a definition. Produce a sequence of instructions in binary form for a computer to solve a particular problem. And that comes right out of a CS0 book. Writing a program means an understanding of computer systems, an understanding of the programming language, and an understanding of the problem. Most of you will not do software development in your careers, but you're going to write a whole bunch of little bitty Python programs or something like that to massage data around. And you may as well be prepared that that's going to happen to you. Okay, the earliest programming languages were done in the language of the machine, namely binary numbers. It was not long after, we, after programming with binary numbers that somebody said, let us write a program that will translate mnemonics like ADD into the number for the add instruction because it's really much easier to remember ADD than it is to remember which number means add. Okay, that's called an assembler. Assemblers evolved rather fast to add a bunch more bookkeeping stuff. I could give names to storage locations and then refer to them by name. This is the thing that became variables. The assembler produces roughly one machine instruction per line of code. And you saw that when you did the TBC assembler exercise. Each line of TBC code that you wrote produced one line of machine code. And the assembler is specific to a particular computer architecture. So if you've got an assembly program for Motorola 68000 architecture, it is no good on the Intel x86 architecture. Not good for anything at all. High-level languages begin very quickly in the 1950s. Remember um, ENIAC 1946, 1947, uh, and very sor shortly after that, people began inventing higher-level languages than, than assembly. High-level languages could be machine independent. That is, if I have a, oh, say, Python compiler for a Mac and a Python compiler for Windows 11, I can run the same Python program on both machines, even though they are very different. High-level languages are closer to the language of the programmer. The assembler language is really as close to the language of the machine. High-level languages use a translator program called a compiler. All right, I guarantee you this is on the final, so listen up. That didn't work when I said program counter, but I got, I got some attention with it this time. The compiler translates one high-level language statement into multiple machine instructions. Okay, one high-level language statement, that should say generates, not generated. Um, I'm getting old. I can see mistakes when they're blown up on a giant screen. One high-level language statement generates several machine instructions. Okay, early high-level languages, Fortran, which is an abbreviation of formula translation and was originally written in all capital letters, and COBOL, the common business-oriented language. The uh, person in the picture is Admiral Dr. Grace Murray Hopper, as she looked in the 1940s. By the time I had the, the pleasure of meeting Dr. Hopper twice in the 1980s when she was a dynamite little old lady. Grace Hopper was a particular champion of COBOL and being a naval captain in those days, 
I think she's a lieutenant uh, in the picture there. Hopper was able to get a requirement that any computer bought by the Navy had to have a COBOL compiler available. And, you know, everybody wants to sell stuff to the military, so everybody had a COBOL compiler for their computer. COBOL still runs much of the financial world. I was talking to a guy who was a defense contractor a couple of weeks ago, and they have an IBM mainframe that runs stuff in COBOL. They're not particularly happy about the mainframe, but their stuff works and they're afraid to mess with it, which is good. Fortran still runs much of science. There are two different, now I've given you two kinds of language translators, assemblers, one line of code for each machine instruction and compilers, one line of code generates multiple machine instructions. Then there are some other divisions. A procedural language is one where the programmer writes code describing how to accomplish a task. So a Python program is a procedural program. You describe what steps have to be taken to accomplish a task. A fourth generation language is, and I, li I like SQL as an example, the programmer describes what should be done. So select all records from the faculty table with last name Brown. Turning that into SQL, really you just push a couple of words around and you've got an SQL statement. You do not have to care how that happens, only what the result is. That's the fourth generation language. Language components, there's a lexicon, that is just a list of all the legal words and the meaning and type of each word in the language. Syntax is the grammar rules of the language, how you can take those words in the lexicon and arrange them. And if you think about it, there is a, a syntax for English we, we often don't think about it because we learned English, at least most of us, when we were just barely toddling around. But Yoda, if I say Yoda, does everybody, do heads do this? Yoda mangles the syntax of English just enough to make it sound weird, but be recognizable. The syntax mangled was Yoda speak. Okay. And then the semantics, the meanings of the words. Zap. Okay. Compilers translate high level language into low level machine instructions. We call the high level language the source code and the generated machine instructions the object code. If I'm using a compiler language or an assembler language actually, Program changes require recompiling. I have to run the thing that is the compiler and regenerate the object code. Don't worry very much about this diagram. If you were taking computer science, you would end up writing an assembler probably. But the process is first lexical analysis. We look for legal words and we build a symbol table. In the symbol table are our variable names and our method names. Then the language gets tokenized, so we're going to use fixed length tokens instead of those variable length words. Do syntax and semantic analysis and that's kind of back and forth. Finally, code generation and then optimization. There are good optimizing compilers. An optimizing compiler in 2024 can probably produce more efficient code than an expert assembly language programmer. Optimization is an analysis of the generated code first to reduce the amount to get rid of unnecessary repeated operations to reorganize parts of the program and to make it use resources effectively. So for example, if I have a calculation that I've coded within the body of the loop, of a loop, but that calculation doesn't use any variable that was changed in the loop, 
It doesn't have to be in the loop. It can be pulled up above the loop and run only once instead of the bazillion times as we go through the loop. Here's one that surprises people. Different compilers can produce different results. Compile the same program with two different compilers on two different machines and probably get different run times. All right, once a program has been compiled, there's this thing called a linker or a linkage editor. And it's the job of the linker to grab all of those library routines that are part of a language so that you don't have to code them and merge the library routines from the block at the bottom there with the object code generated by the compiler. And that linkage process is what produces the almost completely final executable file. And I've said almost completely because there's another step and that's the loader. Linker's search libraries find library routines. Um, that library is the collection of pre-written functions. Um, the linker determines the memory locations that each module will occupy and adjusts the addresses in the object code. So why, to, why do that? I want to be able to build a single executable program from more than one object code file, maybe compiled at different times. Uh, I want to use the libraries that come with a language, and I use them through a linker. But I also might want to do something like assign one component, to, uh, one programmer to write utility routines and the other one to write a main program, and then have those linked together so that the main program can use the utility routines. The loader takes the output of the linker and loads it into main memory. If there are any modules that are not already linked, they get linked by the loader. These are, if you speak Windows, these are the DLL files, dynamic linking loader files that get um, included when a program is loaded. By the time the loader is finished, the program is in memory and ready for execution. The very first high-level languages, Fortran and COBOL, among them, there was also something called Autocoder, which was a very optimistic name. Its Autocoder was about like the Tesla Autopilot. Those first high-level languages, were there was no theory about how to do this right. And so people made it up as they went along. Later languages, including things like Java, but not so much Python, were designed specifically to prevent certain kinds of programming mistakes. All right, in Java, and I think y'all did not have to take a Java course, is that right? Didn't have to take Java, okay. Unlike Python, Java requires you to declare every variable with a data type. So this one is an integer, this one is a string, this one is a floating point. And then, it prevents you from doing something like multiplying an integer by a string. Python doesn't do that. Python will turn your string into an integer for you. Maybe not quite exactly that bad, but Python does dynamic typing. Okay, a third kind of language. We had talked about assemblers and compilers. The third type of language processor is the interpretive language. And they work because we have faster CPUs than we had in 1950. An interpreter reads a statement in a high-level language and immediately executes the equivalent machine instructions. No compilation, no generation of machine code. Read this statement and do what it says. Some interpretive languages Python is one of them, Java is another one, can generate an intermediate form called bytecode. So we're going to do most of the hard work of processing the language and then generate something that can be executed by a virtual machine. Java exposes the bytecode. 
in the uh, in the files that come out of the Java compiler. Python doesn't. The, the bytecode is still there behind the scenes, but Python doesn't let you see it. A interpreter reads source code and executes equivalent machine instructions one statement at a time. It takes longer to execute. It's particularly bad for loops. Uses more memory because now I have both the language translator and whatever application you have written are both in memory at the same time. With compilation, first it's the compiler, then the application. Faster testing, faster code modification. Interpreted languages include Java, Python, there should be a comma, Perl, PHP, there are a bunch of others. JavaScript is interpreted. Okay, so that's languages. Assembler, one assembly statement generates one machine instruction about. Assembler languages are computer architecture specific. Compilers, one high level language statement can generate multiple machine instruction statements. And compilers can be machine independent. Interpreters can also be machine independent. There is no translation. An interpreter reads a high-level language statement and does what it says, immediately executes the equivalent machine instructions. Okay? And that, I guarantee, is on the final. I promise you. The Structured Programming Theorem, 1966, Corrado, Bohm, and Giuseppe Jacopini proved that any correct program needs only sequence selection and iteration. Sequence is doing one, things af one thing after another, and it is the native mode of execution of a von Neumann architecture computer because the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. So y'all thought I was being arbitrary when I made such a big deal about that, but it goes all through how computers work. Selection is the if then else, and we can make an if statement by jamming a new address into the program counter and we'll branch off to a new place. Iteration is looping and we go around and around once again by changing the program counter. Edsger Dijkstra in 1968 wrote a letter to the Communications of the Association for Computing Machinery that was published with the headline Go To Considered Harmful. This is the go to statement or the unconditional branch. Assembly languages have unconditional branches, and the unconditional branch that has to be there in assembly language got migrated into high-level languages as the go-to statement. All right, that let people write spaghetti code. Do this, do this, go to over there, do something else, do something else, go back over here. And... Once you've written the spaghetti code, even the person who wrote it can't figure it out. There was, until quite recently, still a, a use for that go-to, for that unconditional branch, and it was error handling. However, all modern languages have try-catch blocks, and the try-catch block deals with the error handling without that go-to statement. So no more go-to statements in modern languages, and that is a good thing. Object-oriented programming, it was intended to address Brooks' contention of no two parts alike. Did that come out in English? I had a, a little bit of brain fade there. You're shaking your head no. Ask me a question. The, the goal of object orientation is to address Fred Brooks' contention that we do programming and, and make no two parts alike. That was where I talked about three or four standard sizes for bricks. The goal of object-oriented programming is a library of standardized parts. This hasn't worked yet, 
maybe it will, but it hasn't worked yet. Uh, goal, a library of standardized parts. We're going to build our programs out of those standardized parts. Programs are a collection of objects, and each object has both data and code. We call the data attributes and the code behaviors. And so I might have a date object that has a behavior called increment, and I might be able to add, say, 30 days to a date object and get the date 30 days hence, which turns out not to be as easy as it sounds when you say it, uh, because you have to worry about 30 days, half September, April, June, and no wonder, right? And then you have to worry about leap years. Then you have to worry about centesimal years, which are not leap years. And if all of that stuff could be packaged so that you didn't have to worry about it, whoever wrote the package worries about it, a huge source of error could be removed. Okay, there are three properties of object-oriented programming. Encapsulation, that is, we're going to hide the data and the code except those parts that need to be exposed to the rest of the program. Inheritance. I can define an object and then define another object with the same properties and behaviors plus additional properties and behaviors. And an example might be I have an object person. I can define an object student that inherits from person but has all of those things that are unique to being a student. And another object, faculty, that also inherits from person, but has those properties, or attributes, I guess I should be saying, those attributes that are unique to being a faculty member. Polymorphism, the word means many shapes, and there are a couple of ways to, to implement polymorphism. The one that's easiest to understand is we look at the data types with which a function is called and do different things depending on the data types. Then there's the integrated development environment. You had to work with an IDE, and I'm not sure which Python IDE you used. The integrated development environment includes a program editor, a compiler, and a debugger. So Visual Studio is one, Visual Basic is another, JGRASP is a third, I have forgotten what the popular Python IDE is. I like Thani for doing Python, but I'm weird. Program editors are specialized and language aware. They know something about the syntax of a language, and so they might be able to identify syntax errors. The compiler and the editor will be integrated in an ID in an integrated development environment. Debuggers are language specific and they allow you to do things like set a breakpoint. And by breakpoint, I mean when you get to this instruction, stop and let me see what's going on. Okay? Step through programs one instruction at a time, check and even change variable values. Something, even if you do no programming at all in your information technology careers, you are going to need version control for programs that maybe other people are changing. Keeps track of every module in a system, keeps track of changes, allows changes to be undone. Microsoft should undo all of the changes they put into Windows 11 and it would make me happy. There are systems like Git that allow branching so I can say, I'm going to do a branch, a fork, and do something different, but I'm not going to mess with the main flow of the system. So I add new features with a branch. The main branch is always production quality, always tested and ready to go. So once again, the assembler language is the machine-specific language we have high-level languages, those are compiled languages, divided into procedural languages where the programmer describes how to do something, and fourth-generation languages where the programmer describes what to do, like SQL. 
Object-oriented languages are procedural and compiled languages, but the idea is we're going to be able to build this library of standardized parts. There are a lot of standardized parts in Java. There is a Java object that is a web server, and the whole web server encapsulated in one Java object. I think maybe we went just a little too far with that. The assembler translates machine code one instruction per line of code. The compiler, closer to human language, multiple machine instructions gener are generated by each line of high-level language code. Interpreter reads the high-level language code and does what it says, immediately performs the equivalent machine instructions. So there's no translation step. Source code, that's a program in human-readable form. Object code, program that has been translated into the binary language of the machine. Byte code is an intermediate form between source code and object code. It's not machine language, but it is the source code essentially shrunk and optimized so that it can be run by an interpreter. And for Java, that's the Java Virtual Machine. So, programming. We started out with this definition, producing a sequence of instructions in binary form for a computer to solve a particular problem. And to do programming, we need to understand computer systems, we need to understand the programming language, which does not happen in this course, and we need to understand the problem which also doesn't happen in this course, but I'll tell you that it's important. Have a nice weekend. Do some studying. Take care, and I'll see you on Tuesday.